right. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed that break, uh, got your coffee refreshed and is ready to go now. Um, just wanted to take a minute again to thank our sponsors, um, Brown and Caldwell, Carollo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Solutions, Slade in Construction, HGR Engineering, Tetra Tech, and KJ. Thank you again uh, for um, sponsoring this and all of our summits. Um, next up, we have uh, an incredible presentation planned for you from Amanda Watson and Colin Hickman. Colin is the Community Engagement Manager for the City of Boise Department of Public Works. Whoop, whoop, Boise. In this role, he's responsible for overall department communications, messaging, and marketing. He manages the overall content strategy, creative process, and public relations for major citywide initiatives. Colin serves as the primary media contact and public information officer for the department. He has a bachelor's degree in history and a master's, master's degree in sustainable development. Amanda Watson is the owner and founder of Atlas Strategic Communications. She has nearly a decade of experience in strategic communications and public engagement. Amanda's work has been recognized with more than a dozen awards, including honors from the Idaho Press Club, Idaho Advertising Fe Federation, and Capital City Communicators. Amanda received her bachelor's degree in public relations from the University of Idaho and is professionally certified in facilitation. I cannot wait to hear uh, from my fellow Boiseans. Uh, Amanda and Colin, take it away. Hey, Steve, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, Amanda, do you want to start off? Do you want to introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll take it? Sure. Yeah, thanks for having us, Steve. Thanks for that very kind introduction. We're really happy to be here. Um, I won't take too much time. Um, like Steve said, I'm um, with Atlas Strategic Communications, and it's been honestly my privilege to work with the City of Boise on this project, and we're excited to share with you uh, the work that we've been doing for the last five years now it's been, um, and I'll let Colin kick us off, and we'll talk about what we've done to do utility planning for the City of Boise's Water Renewal Utility Plan. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. And, and Steve, thanks again for that intro. And we're really, really genuinely excited to talk with everyone today. This is a neat opportunity. And so you can see there from the title, Re-Envisioning Strategic Planning for Community-Based Water Management is kind of a mouthful. What we wanted to talk today about is really the city of Boise, about four or five years ago, undertook a massive process of re-envisioning, re rethinking about what our, our utility could be. I'm sure there's going to be, you know, engineering solutions for we need more capacity to treat water, our infrastructure needs updating, but we also really wanted to reimagine right now we just we clean a ton of water and we put it back into the river, but we wanted to we wanted to look at could we do things differently what what does the community want us to do with all that water what's important to the community. So we really evaluated everything from creating drinking water to should the utility be producing energy to how might we go about recycling water and everything in between. So, you know, it's a mouthful of a title, but really this presentation, what Amanda and I are gonna be talking about today is just all the blood, sweat and tears that went into genuinely bringing the community into a really meaningful conversation about what could our utility be in the future? We, do, we don't have to do things the way that we always have done them. And in fact, we shouldn't be doing that. So what does it look like going forward? So this is an, an incredible project. We learned a lot, um, got some things right, got some things wrong. And we'll tell you a little bit about that at the end as well. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So just to kind of set the stage, I'll, I'll just tee it off. And then Amanda's going to kind of walk through a lot of the nets and bolts and just a lot of the tactics we used, how we went about engaging the community. But I just wanted to highlight, you know, two things from the outset of this presentation. I think everyone in this uh, session would, would know that, that sometimes water renewal, um, sewer is not the sexiest of topics, but, but we were genuinely blown away by the interest of the community in these things. We know Boise specifically is a high desert city. Uh, the, the Boise River running right through town is just an, an absolute gem in our community. And so the tide of water is incredibly important to our residents. And we were continually blown away by the amount of people that uh, 
stepped up in, in new and different ways that uh, we never would have thought of. And, and it was incredibly important to how we re-envisioned the utility. So you can see here, just shy of 3,000 residents um, participated in, in the planning efforts um, for Boise uh, for di uh, through different means. Next slide. And our, our real job, which Amanda will get to here in a bit, is, is to try and, and get to people in new and different ways. It, it's no longer good enough to say, hey, come down to City Hall and provide your testimony, uh, find parking, uh, take time away from your family. How do we do things differently, provide multiple opportunities, and bring new voices, new people to the table that have never been engaged? So I just wanted to kind of uh, overlay that on the top, and then Amanda's going to kind of talk through some of how we structured our outreach through different phases and what some of those tactics looked like. Thanks, Colin. Next slide. So really our public involvement approach um, and the way we're gonna talk about it today is in um, buckets of the outreach and then the feedback. So how we applied the feedback that we got to the plan, but we also, uh, just for the sake of patting ourselves on the back, want to talk a little bit about what we did. Um, and like Colin said, really diversifying that approach. You know, we're dealing with lots of different constituencies in the city of Boise. We have a growing community. And so how we engaged that um, very diverse fabric of our community. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. So um, this slide really demonstrates our intention to not um, eat the whole elephant in one bite, I think is the cliche term. Um, but really starting in 2016, we took a bird's eye perspective and at, came to the community with very, very high level um, generic questioning. So basically it was that approach in 2016 was 100% feedback gathering. Um, and then in 2018, uh, coming back into the community for our second phase of feedback gathering, it was about 25% education. We took the learnings from 2016 and we said, here's what we heard, what do you think? And gathered about 75% feedback from the community. And then we got even narrower in 2019, taking the lessons from both 2016 and 2018 um, and presented them back to the community again and got even more focused. Uh, uh, and then right now in 2020, uh, believe it or not, this project is still ongoing. We're uh, in front of our decision makers and leadership in the city of Boise and asking for their validation. Um, we've gone through a business case evaluation, um, but we still need to get back in front of the community and talk about implementation and funding. So that's essentially where we're at right now. Next slide. And so, like I just said, basically what a what building a plan from community input looks like is a long term process. It's been five years in the making and um, it's not something that can happen overnight. And really, you know, when Colin and I were talking about this presentation, it's it starts with the idea that you really have to be um, willing uh, and adaptable. You can't have an outcome in mind. You, uh, We've heard a lot of really surprising things from the community that we'll talk about that we didn't necessarily expect. And it takes time to take that feedback and then apply it to the next round of feedback and then ask the community what you think about that and adjust again, um, taking that data. And obviously we have lots of different perspectives in the community. So um, this is a long process, but for a, project as large and um, an investment as large as this is, it was well worth the effort in the end. Next slide. So phase one objectives, like I said, it was very high level. Uh, we wanted to come to the community and understand what were, what was the understanding of water renewal? You know, what was the perspective of water renewal? How did people view the utility? And also what were their priorities in the future? So really high level. Um, and we also wanted to collect a, a statistically valid sample of the community. That's a recurring theme that you'll see through all of the phases. So at that time, 400 people were interviewed via a phone survey um, and that advised the next phase of work. Next slide. And phase two objectives was more about values. We got really into what does the community see for their water in the future? Um, both water renewal and their water. You know, we talked about reuse. We talked about um, specific possibilities that were derived from phase one. We'll talk about what we heard in a minute, but those uh, conversations really advised phase two. 
And we sort of broke these out into two separate objectives. Basically, we wanted to have really in-depth feedback from a targeted sample so we could have really substantive conversations. But we also really wanted to have that broad, statistically valid sample as well. Um, so we put together some tactics that would accomplish both of those objectives. Next slide. And then phase three, this got even more specific. We heard a lot of different possibilities for the future, but some of them work better together. Some of them play off of each other better. Um, and so we needed the technical team to help us work those solutions together. So that's what the technical analysis piece did for us. So they compiled all of that public feedback and put them into what we called portfolios. And then we brought those back to the public for their reaction to those portfolios and said, you know, what do you think about this? How do you feel like these things work for you? Um, and then we talked about the risks and benefits of those portfolios. So we got even more granular in this third phase of work. And um, this is really where it got really meaty. You know, we'll talk about tactically what we did in this phase of work, but we, we had great community engagement in phase three, lots of uh, participation. Um, and again, we wanted to have both substantive in-depth feedback conversations, and then also that really broad, statistically valid sample. And all, uh, spoiler alert, we blew through these goals of, of statistically valid samples because we had great community interest in this project. Next slide. And then finally, phase four. So this is where we're at right now. Um, we're talking to community leadership about what the public said and what they want to see in the future. And we have a saying on the team, like we were outcome agnostic in this and you know what this plan looks like in the end is um, completely shaped by the community and and it makes it a lot easier to come in front of city council and say you know this is what the public has said to us based on lots of rounds of feedback and so having those conversations makes it a lot easier um, when you have a lot of data to back it up so that's where we're at right now um, again, we're uh, about to talk about implementation, and this is a large project, so there's a big financial, um, you know, uh, ramification to that. So we'll uh, be talking to the public as well about what their priorities are and how they think about funding and how that might affect their lives, um, and that's, that's coming up next. Next slide. All right, so we'll go through these things quickly, but phase one, next slide. Uh, we did a phone survey, 400 participants. We also did some interviews with the community, 35 participants. That was city council, um, some leadership in the business community. Next slide. Uh, this is kind of some just data as we collected demographically. One of the big goals throughout this entire project has been get a really broad, diverse group of people. And if we weren't seeing that, we found ways to reach those people. Um, so you'll see here, we had a good breakdown of male and female. You'll see pretty regularly that there's lots more ownership than renters, but we found ways to include renters in our feedback gathering um, through targeted outreach. Uh, and then also um, a good income spread as well. Next slide. So what we asked, like we talked about, you know, really high level familiarity with the utilities programs. What's the general feedback? We learned that the utility has a really good reputation in Boise, that people are really happy with their services. They really like reliable services. They're very happy that when they flush the toilet, it goes away. That's awesome. <laughs> so that was important to us because if you have a negative reputation and your community is not happy with your services, embarking on a plan like this is going to be really challenging. So starting with that information was really important to the city to know that the community viewed them well and that um, they were starting at a, you know, reputation capital positive was an important place to start. And then we also learned that the river, the Boise River is incredibly important to the community. It was a resounding theme that we saw in every single one of our pieces of feedback. Um, and then we talked about their personal ranking of priorities and it was the environment, cost and reliability. Um, some of the things that we maybe anticipated would come up didn't necessarily come up, but it was surprising maybe uh, to me that the environment superseded cost. Next slide. Phase two, next slide. So this is where we got a little bit more diverse in our approach. We, like I said, we wanted to do some really targeted in-depth kind of feedback gathering. So the way that we did that is 
Um, Colin and I and the rest of our team decided we wanted to execute some focus groups and focus groups are self-selecting, but we wanted to get a really broad you know, range of the community and have just really in-depth conversations with them. So we ran four different focus groups. We had some open houses, but we also wanted um, really widespread feedback as well. So we had an online survey that ran for about five weeks. Um, and then we also had engaged the youth community as well. So we had a focus group with the mayor's advisory on youth, um, which they had really interesting feedback as well. You know, these are the kids coming up in the future. So we incorporated that feedback as well. Um, also, you have to do some marketing when you uh, do outreach like this to get people to engage. So we had some really fun ideas, had it interact with the public to get them to take the survey, for example, or to participate in the focus groups. Um, and we'll, we'll show some of those things that we did in a minute. Next slide. So we got to go to Tree Fort, which is a big music festival in Boise, which was a really great time. We had a photo booth um, set up for the entire duration of the festival. And in non-COVID times, we were able to participate in the music festival and uh, there were about 400 or 500 people who came and took their photos uh, printed out right there. And then we were able to collect their email addresses. So we were able to engage them on an ongoing basis. You'll see one of the participations taking the picture. The background was the Boise River. And then we had these signs that you can see here with information about um, water and, and how we treat and renew water in the city of Boise throughout the festival. Next slide. And at the end, when we collected the data, um, you know, we, again, really wanted to have a diverse sample of um, feedback. So if we weren't getting it, we use geotargeting on social media to get it. So, you know, you can target by um, home ownership and income and particularly next slide. Uh, we were seeing some zip codes in the city of Boise were not responding to the survey as much as other zip codes. So we would find those zip codes and geotarget them until we saw an uptick in response. We really wanted to make sure that every single zip code in the city of Boise had a substantial number of responses and they were represented in the survey. So we pushed on those zip codes until we saw the responses tick up as well. Next slide. This is just a, one of our focus groups in action. Next slide. So the feedback in 2018, um, we asked them which water renewal solutions represent their values. This came directly out of the round of feedback before 2016, the phone survey, we heard about you know, what's important to the community and from that solutions came out of um, and ideas were presented. So we came to them in 2018 and said, how do you feel about direct potable reuse? How do you feel about industrial reuse? What about you know, river discharge, which is what we've been doing for a long time? Um, and we got their reactions to that. So we asked them a ton of questions and what we learned from them is people really want system redundancy. They were really interested in lots of different, maybe smaller uh, facilities throughout the community so that there, if there was maybe a massive event that might take one of the systems uh, down that we wouldn't be in really big trouble. They were really interested in community resiliency. They were very pro conserving water, but also reusing water and reuse, not just in one capacity, but the community was very interested in reuse in a lot of different applications. And we'll talk about how that's challenging in, um, in a minute, but primarily from a cost perspective, when the community wants everything, it is, uh, it's expensive. <laughs> And then we also asked them some energy energy questions. You know, can we use some of the energy that's created through the treatment process and become energy neutral or even energy positive? Um, and what we learned from the community is they really want an energy efficient utility, but they don't see the utility as someone who is, you know, maybe selling energy back to the grid right now. There was lower support for that. But there was also lower support at this time for direct potable reuse. So that was, there's still kind of in the city of Boise an ick factor for that. So very interesting feedback that we got from 2018 that was really helpful in advising our feedback in 2019. Next slide. So phase three, next slide. 
Um, we did an online survey again, like I said, crushing that goal of 500 statistically relevant sample size. We got 1,100 pe people responding. And then we formed a six month long advisory group. This was an immense um, lift for our team. We did, uh, we had really great community participation. We basically recruited members of the public in what we called the cross section of the community, you know, low income, um, minority, in industry, uh, all sorts of different uh, areas that we could possibly recruit, and we asked them to participate in this. Next slide. Uh, and this is just us participating in different ways. Next slide. Um, I'm going to go through some of these just to be mindful of time. Next slide. These are just demographic, uh, same thing, recruiting um, to make sure we have good participation. Next slide. And this is our advisory group on our last meeting. Colin actually had to jet off because there was a geothermal break. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so what we learned in, in 2019 was people um, really prioritize the river. They uh, support options that enhance the river. They are really interested in, like I said, in decentralization of assets for that system redundancy, like we talked about and highly localized solutions. And we did talk about large scale food production um, for human consumption, and there was less support for that. And it was primarily because of cost. They just didn't see the ROI for that solution at this time. Next slide. So this is interesting. This was uh, between advisory group meeting four and five. This is just meeting four was all of the solutions based on values and all of the solutions based on cost. So you'll see that, uh, Closed loop and decentralization really shrunk down because while the public may really love those solutions from a values perspective, with the introduction of cost, things do change a bit, but you know, maybe not substantially for all of the other solutions. And this was incorporated into our into our plan. Next slide. This was um, one of our industry partners on the advisory group just talking about how um, uh, positive the experience was serving on the advisory group and we got lots of good positive feedback from others as well. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Colin to talk about where we're at now. Yeah, so thanks, Amanda. Unless uh, we think that we are done with this, uh, as Amanda described, it's kind of we started out with the world of possibilities and started funneling them down, narrowing them down. So uh, we presented kind of the final plan to city council, and I encourage you to reach out if you're interested in what that actually looks like. Um, but really, uh, what we did in 2020 was starting to pivot from the public then to decision makers. So I won't go through all the tactics there, but publicly facing what that meant, and you can go to the next slide, please, on how we presented actually the plan was a lot, we broke it into chunks. So we started telling weekly stories about infrastructure condition, about uh, climate change, about some of the drivers, some of the items in the plan, because we knew that a, a massive 200 page document is not gonna be palatable for folks, folks are busy. And so how do we, how do we get people engaged around water, something that they're passionate about? So we found breaking, breaking it down into kind of bite-sized pieces and telling stories uh, was really effective to kind of get the word out. Next, please. So where we have to go uh, from here is that uh, we have a lot more work. I think, did we go backwards or is that a duplicate? Maybe go forward. Yeah, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, so on the 13th of October, we will have a city council de decision on approval, um, hopefully of the water renewal utility plan. And then we will go forward to, next slide. We will go forward to kind of the financial piece because we know that, uh, you know, once the, the utility plan has been adopted and goes forward, it's gonna be really interesting to talk then about what that impact that has on rates, how do people uh, engage with paying for that? Uh, what burden does that have on different classes? So this is kind of what we have been saying is that uh, this is the uh, end of the beginning and there's a lot more work ahead. So in the one minute I have remaining, Amanda and I talked earlier and I kind of wanted to break it out into five takeaways for folks, what we learned and what we felt was really important. The first is that any sort of massive utility planning effort no matter how technical you think it is, the community should be and has to be part of that process. I think all of us will be shocked at what they have to say. Some stuff will really surprise us. 
some stuff we may think that we take for granted that we already know, uh, but they've got to be part of the process. And I think secondly is focusing on not doing community engagement as lip service. It's like, yep, check that box. We heard from the public, but but what we've found time and time again is most beneficial, most impactful is how does that feedback then shape the plan? How do what we heard tangibly alter things? I think the perception in a lot of communities is, yeah, you're listening, but you are, you're going to go do what you're going to go do. And so it's incumbent upon us to really share how, the, how what we heard from you actually changed what we were planning on doing. And then the third one, which... Uh, you know, Amanda and I tried hard, uh, but this is, you know, a lesson learned. It's, it's like, I don't know that we quite got there is we, you have to be ruthless in eliminating industry jargon and acronyms. You know, if you're talking to a single mom or a single dad, that's got dropping kids off and going uh, here and there talking about MGDs and secondary clarifiers is just, it's not going to work. And we tried every day to like pair that really talk to people in the way that they converse and it's hard like you know we missed some stuff we we could have gone farther but i i would say just like be ruthless in in like really speaking to people the way that they talk not in the way that we talk um and then fourth is just if you're communications professional demand or i guess i should say uh, ask very forcefully to be at the table for any sort of even if, no matter how technical the discussion is on these utility plans you bring a different and new perspective that is incredibly important to all of this work and if conversely if you're a technical person if you're an engineer make sure that your communications or community engagement person is there from the get-go I, I promise you they will help they will save you heartache in the long run um and then the fifth one would just be no matter what your plan is, beat it up in every different way. Be a true devil's advocate. Ask all the questions that no one else wants to ask. You bring value as a communications or community engagement professional to be able to ask some of the like the questions that um, from a technical perspective may make total sense, uh, but from different perspectives, maybe not so much. So just beat the plan up from every different angle and really be a devil's advocate because it pays dividends in the long run. So with that, I will uh, wrap it up. So we know we tried to fit in a lot, but we really appreciate everyone's time. Wow, that was that was awesome. And as a citizen in Boise, I'm really glad you both were working on this project uh, uh, for me. So thank you very much. Thank you for all that information. Um, we did get a couple of questions. So um, you know, I'll let uh, whoever needs to answer each of these, but um, what was the single most successful activity you did during the planning effort? And maybe what's something that you would have done differently? Go ahead, Amanda. I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts. You know, I think that it's not a single, uh, single item. I think really the magic is in diversity. You know, I think having a diverse approach is the most important thing you can possibly do. Um, I think, you know, if you were going to, the phased approach is definitely a, a monster in itself, but um, I think we got the most substantive feedback out of the advisory group, but pairing that alongside a survey was really impactful because we got really broad feedback from the survey, but we also were able to have really, really important one-on-one -on -one discussions with the public through something like the advisory group, which you can also accomplish through a focus group as well. But I won't lie, the relationships that we built with the advisory group were really important to the process. Yeah, I think she nailed it. Nothing to add. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have, did you have to uh, change any of the strategy or timing because of the pandemic for the work that you were doing? Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, I mean, 100%, absolutely. I, we we had the, uh, what we thought was a beautifully built uh, kind of rollout plan for once we had the, the final utility plan, how we would go forward, communicate that to the public, communicate that to the city council. And so we had to be super nimble. And and so we we glossed over one of those slides pretty quickly, but we, we kind of went with as I talked about briefly, just more of the, the short stories that we got out to the public, but then to city council, you know, we put the onus on them. We, we sent a lot more memos than we would typically, um, but because of the times that we're in, we just had to pivot and we had to be creative um, and, it, and it's, it's hard. And, and, you know, looking back, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to do a debrief after this and see, did, did we nail it on, on how we pivoted? But at the very least was really proud of the team for being able to take what you know, we were in the midst of it. We were in the trenches. We were running, like I'm sure many on this 
uh, listening in today were in different projects and it just, we had to pivot really quickly. No, that's awesome. And uh, thank you both again for being here today and uh, sharing this story with us. I think there's uh, a lot of really amazing takeaways. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for you to be here. Um, we are now going to move over to the next session, session four. So I think it's that way. Uh, click on down and we'll see you all over there. Um,